pathocracy and its ideology. It should be noted that a great ideology with mesmerizing values can also easily deprive people of the capacity for self-critical control over their behavior. The adherents of such ideas tend to lose sight of the fact that the means used, not just the end, will be decisive for the results of their activities. Whenever they reach for overly radical methods of action, still convinced that they are serving their idea, they are not aware that their goal has already changed. The principle, the end justifies the means, opens the door to a different kind of person for whom a great idea is useful for purposes of liberating themselves from the uncomfortable pressure of normal human custom. Every great ideology thus contains danger, especially for small minds. Therefore, every great social movement and its ideology can become a host upon which some pathocracy initiates its parasitic life. The ideology in question may have been marked by deficits in truth and moral criteria from the very outset, or by the effects of activities by pathological factors. The original, very high-minded idea may also have succumbed to early contamination, characteristic of a particular time and social circumstance. If such an ideology is infiltrated by foreign, local, cultural material which, being heterogeneous, destroys the original, coherent structure of the idea, the actual value may become so enfeebled that it loses some of its attractiveness for reasonable people. Once weakened, however, the sociological structure can succumb to further de degeneration including the activation of pathological factors until it has become transformed into its caricature. The name is the same, but the contents are different. Differentiating the essence of the pathological phenomenon from its contemporary ideological host is thus a basic and a necessary task, both for scientific theoretical purposes and for finding practical solutions for the problems derived from the existence of the above-mentioned macro-social phenomena. If, in order to designate a pathological phenomenon, we accept the name furnished by the ideology of a social movement which succumbed to degenerative processes, we may lose any ability to understand or evaluate that ideology and its original contents, or to effect proper classification of the phenomenon per se. This error is not semantic. It is the keystone of all other comprehension errors regarding such phenomena, rendering us intellectually helpless and depriving us of our capacity for purposeful practical action. This error is based upon compatible propaganda elements of incompatible social systems. This has, unfortunately, become much too common and is reminiscent of the first, very clumsy attempts to classify mental diseases according to the systems of delusions manifested by the patients. Even today, people who have not received training in this field will consider a sick person who manifests sexual delusions to be crazy in this area or someone with religious delusions to be a religious maniac. The author has even encountered a patient who insisted that he had become the object of cold and hot rays, paresthesia, on the basis of a special agreement concluded by the USA and the USSR. As early as the end of the 19th century, famous pioneers of contemporary psychiatry correctly distinguished between the disease and the patient's system of delusions. A disease has its own etiological causes, whether determined or not, and its own pathodynamics and symptomatics 
which distinguish its nature. Various delusional systems can become manifest within the same disease, and similar systems can appear in various diseases. The delusions which have sometimes become so systemic that they convey the impression of an actual story originate in the patient's nature and intelligence, especially in the imaginations of the environment within which he grew up. These can be disease-induced characterizations of his former political and social convictions. After all, every mental illness has its particular style of deforming human minds, producing nuanced but characteristic differences known for some time to psychiatrists and which help them render a diagnosis. Thus deformed, the world of former fantasies is put to work for a different purpose, concealing the dramatic state of the disease from one's own consciousness and from public opinion for as long as possible. An experienced psychiatrist does not attempt premature dissolution of such a delusional system. That would provoke the patient's suicidal tendencies. The doctor's main object of interest remains the disease he is trying to cure. There is usually insufficient time to discuss a patient's delusions with him unless it becomes necessary for reasons of safety of the said patient and other people. Once the disease has been cured, however, psychotherapeutic assistance in reintegrating the patient into the world of normal thought is definitely indicated. If we effect a sufficiently penetrating analysis of the phenomenon of pathocracy and its relationship to its ideology, we are faced with a clear analogy to the above described relationship now familiar to all psychiatrists. Some differences will appear later in the form of details and statistical data which can be interpreted both as a function of the above mentioned characteristic style of caricaturizing an ideology, pathocracy effects and as a result of the macrosocial character of the phenomenon. As a counterpart of disease, pathocracy has its own etiological factors which make it potentially present in every society, no matter how healthy. It also has its own pathodynamic processes, which are differentiated as a function of whether the pathocracy in question was born in that particular country, primary pathocracy, was artificially infected in the country by some other system of the kind, or was imposed by force. We have already sketched above the ponerogenesis and course of such a macrosocial phenomenon in its primary form, intentionally refraining from mentioning any particular ideology. We shall soon address the two other courses mentioned above. The ideology of pathocracy is created by caricaturizing the original ideology of a social movement in a manner characteristic of that particular pathological phenomenon. The above mentioned hysteroidal states of societies also deform the contemporary ideologies of the times in question, using a style characteristic for them. Just as doctors are interested in disease, the author has become primarily interested in the pathocratic phenomenon and the analysis thereof. In a similar manner, the primary concern of those people who have assumed responsibility for the fate of nations should be curing the world of this heretofore mysterious disease. The proper time will come for critical and analytical attitudes towards ideologies which have become the delusional systems of such phenomena during historical times. We should at present focus our attention upon the very essence of the macrosocial pathological phenomena. Understanding the nature of a disease is basic to any search for the proper methods of treatment. The same applies by analogy 
with regard to that macrosocial pathological phenomenon, especially since, in the latter case, mere understanding of the nature of the disease starts curing human minds and souls. Throughout the entire process, reasoning approximated to the style elaborated by medicine is the proper method which leads to untangling the contemporary Gordian knot. A pathocracy's ideology changes its function just as occurs with a mentally ill person's delusional system. It stops being a human conviction outlining methods of action and takes on other duties which are not openly defined. It becomes a disguising story, concealing the new reality from people's critical consciousness, both inside and outside one's nation. The first function, a conviction outlining methods of action, soon becomes ineffective for two reasons. On the one hand, reality exposes the methods of action as unworkable. On the other hand, the masses of common people notice the contemptuous attitude toward the ideology represented by the pathocrats themselves. For that reason, the main operational theatre for the ideology consists of nations remaining outside the immediate ambit of the pathocracy, since that world tends to continue believing in ideologies. The ideology thus becomes the instrument for external action to a degree even greater than in the above-mentioned relationship between the disease and its delusional system. Psychopaths are conscious of being different from normal people. That is why the political system inspired by their nature is able to conceal this awareness of being different. They wear a personal mask of sanity and know how to create a macrosocial mask of the same dissimulating nature. When we observe the role of ideology in this macrosocial phenomenon, quite conscious of the existence of this specific awareness of the psychopath, we can then understand why ideology is relegated to a tool-like role. Something useful in dealing with those other naive people and nations. Pathocrats must nevertheless appreciate the function of ideology as being something essential in any ponerogenic group. Especially in the macrosocial phenomenon, which is their homeland. This factor of awareness simultaneously constitutes a certain qualitative difference between the two above mentioned relationships. Pathocrats know that their real ideology is derived from their deviant natures and treat the other, the masking ideology, with barely concealed contempt. And the common people eventually begin to perceive this, as noted above. Thus, a well-developed pathocratic system no longer has a clear and direct relationship to its original ideology, which it only keeps as its primary, traditional tool for action and masking. For practical purposes of pathocratic expansion, other ideologies may be useful, even if they contradict the main one and help moral denunciation upon it. However, these other ideologies must be used with care, refraining from official acknowledgments within environments wherein the original ideology can be made to appear too foreign, discredited and useless. The main ideology succumbs to symptomatic deformation in keeping with the characteristic style of this very disease, and with that, what has already been stated about the matter. The names and official contents are kept, but another completely different content is insinuated underneath, thus giving rise to the well-known double-talk phenomenon within which the same names have two meanings, one for initiates and one for everyone else. The latter is derived from the original ideology, the former has a specifically pathocratic meaning, 
something which is known not only to the pathocrats themselves, but also is learned by those people living under long-term subjection to their rule. Double talk is only one of many symptoms. Others are the specific facility for producing new names which have suggestive effects and are accepted virtually uncritically, in particular outside the immediate scope of such a system's rule. We must, thus, point out the paramoralistic character and paranoidal qualities frequently contained within these names. The action of paralogisms and paramoralisms in this deformed ideology becomes comprehensible to us based on the information presented in chapter 4. Anything which threatens pathocratic rule becomes deeply immoral. This also applies to the concept of forgiving the pathocrats themselves. It is extremely dangerous and thus immoral. We thus have the right to invent appropriate names which would indicate the nature of the phenomena as accurately as possible in keeping with our recognition and respect for the laws of the scientific methodology and semantics. Such accurate terms will also serve to protect our minds from the suggestive effects of those other names and paralogisms, including the pathological material the latter contain.